The Citizenship Project is brought to you in part by a grant from the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area and the First Tennessee Foundation. In 1831, French sociologist Alexis de Tocqueville toured the United States, discovering a unique trait among its citizens. Americans are forever forming associations. As soon as several Americans have conceived a sentiment, they seek each other out and unite. Thenceforth, they are no longer isolated individuals, but a power whose actions serve as an example. Alexis de Tocqueville, 1840. Tocqueville thought that voluntary associations could play a very important role in sustaining high levels of citizen participation, whether it's in the halls of Congress and legislatures or just in local communities. Democracy was a work in progress, if only because in the United States, complete democracy did not exist. The chief participants in the electoral process were propertied white men. It was a contradictory time when democracy was partly there and in many cases not there at all. The late 19th century was a time of joining. This was a time when there's no real social safety net. So if you get sick and you miss work, there's nothing. Nothing for you to fall back on. Organizations come up where there's a need. These early mutual aid societies are just simply ways of pooling resources to provide some, a little insurance, if you want to call it that. Many different groups, but all with the same overarching idea, people banding together to improve their society or to protect their society. During and after the Civil War, Tennessee saw increasing urbanization, particularly in Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, and Memphis. You had freedmen pouring into these cities, whites as well, leaving the rural areas to find jobs in factories or in other industrial endeavors. Commercial insurance was not an option for most people during this time. It was either too expensive or the insurance companies would deny coverage due to age or racial discrimination. As a society became more urbanized, you start to get a real explosion of these fraternal societies, mutual aid organizations in small towns, in big cities, among immigrant groups. Say these groups arise through necessity to a great extent. You have to do it. If you don't do it, nobody else will. And that's one of the reasons you see them so big among African Americans after the Civil War. Mutual aid societies would pool their funds, their resources. People would pay small amounts, putting together their pennies and their nickels and dimes, and paying this into a common fund. And then out of this common fund, um, when you had a death in a member's family, then the society would help to pay for the funeral expenses, or the society would pay something to the family to help them um, in the event of a death in the family. Groups like the Sons and Daughters of Zion coming together, organizing, and developing a cemetery. There is a real kind of horror of being a pauper having a pauper burial and being buried in a graveyard where you might not even have a name on the gravestone. That's their one chance to kind of show, hey, you know, I'm a person that provided for this. That would be kind of first on the agenda. It's a very fatalistic society in a lot of ways. I think people really are familiar with death, much more so than we are. And you know, death is looming, and they've sort of accepted it in a way. So that's one thing they know is going to come, and they prepare for it. 
Historian Lee Ann Gardner has logged many hours researching Tennessee's African-American benevolent and fraternal lodges. In her spare time, she travels the state, cataloging cemeteries that are, in many cases, forgotten relics from the golden age of mutual aid societies. It's such an interesting time period in American history when people in local communities got together and said, there's something about my life that needs to be better. Either I need care when I'm sick, or I want to make sure that my children are cared for when I'm dead. People gathered together and created organizations to care for each other, but they also use these organizations to build character and hone leadership skills. I don't think there were a lot of opportunities for that before this time for Americans. Opportunities were especially limited for most African Americans. As thousands of former slaves flooded into Tennessee towns during and after the war, they quickly realized that their very survival depended on coming together as a community. Memphis, before the Civil War, had been the center of cotton distribution, but not a large African-American population. The overwhelming majority of the black population was enslaved, uh, with a very small free black population. The African-American population in Memphis was about 4,000. And then during the Civil War, of course, it almost quadruples. Memphis, like most of the South, was going through this period where they were trying to figure out, in a sense, what would these new social, political, economic relationships be like. There was substantial government intervention, actually. The Freedmen's Bureau played an important role integrating and even trying to jumpstart African Americans who were now free and were trying to become even more integral members of their new society and of the new society that was being created through Reconstruction. But at the same time, the government intervention only goes so far. There's sometimes political opposition to government intervention. And so marginalized people, both black and white, have always attempted to pull themselves up by their bootstraps in their local communities by creating mutual aid societies of one kind or another. Reconstruction ends very early in Memphis and Tennessee by 1869. And the African-American community is thrown on, on its own devices. If you look at some of the early churches, like Avery Chapel or Historic First Baptist, you have women's groups and men's organizations coming together and holding bazaars and fairs and all kinds of, of things, fundraising activities, and using the funds that they raised to pay for a physician to serve the community. So you can see how there's that impetus for organizing um, because there's a void there. You have a larger African-American population, but you have a great deal of need in terms of food, clothing, shelter, medical assistance. And we tend to see organizing in terms of mutual aid societies and all kinds of community groups. Several of these groups got their start in Tennessee and went on to become national organizations. A great example is the Independent Order of Immaculates. It started in Nashville in the early 1870s, then spread across the country. These organizations were one of the pillars of African American communities. This is who cared for you when you were sick, rebuilt your house if it burned. There are still places in Tennessee where you can go out and you can see the school and the lodge and the church as well as the cemetery all together. Lodges, such as the United Sons and Daughters of Charity in Bolivar, Tennessee, became the nucleus of the community. When federal support for freedmen ended, African Americans created a benevolent group to fill that void. The original lodge was destroyed by fire and was rebuilt in 1930. Still standing today, it is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. More than just meeting places, lodges were halls of learning. 
Uh, often, this is the way they're learning parliamentary rules. This is the way they're, they're getting those, honing those organizational skills. In fact, there's sort of a stereotype that whites have that this is something blacks are more likely to do than other groups. And if you look at old radio shows and so forth like Amos and Andy, a staple of those, and of course those are produced by whites, is the Lodge. And so, fellow members, I am proud to pay tribute to our brother here on the platform, Mr. Andrew H. Brown, who has done been in our Lodge for 20 years. And Before there's some truth in that in the sense that the Lodge is a very important center of the black community. A part of the fraternal movement that is carried on is that many of them are semi-secret organizations. That's a part of the mystique. The regalia is still a big part of it. My father was a fourth degree knight of St. Peter Claver, and the Claverites are a Catholic fraternal organization, much like the Knights of Columbus. He had a huge hat with a gold plume, and he'd wear his, his black cape with a gold satin lining and the fraternity symbols on each side. The fraternal movement helped the African Americans reach the status of inclusion that was often not a part of a, a segregated experience. Eventually that social service morphs into social elevation and it's expected that fraternity men will take care of each other, will bring each other along, all for one and one for all. While African Americans across Tennessee were forming mutual aid societies, hundreds of similar organizations were being assembled according to cultural heritage, profession, social class, and religion. Jewish community organizations often began as burial societies. Such was the case in Memphis in 1847. Nashville's Hebrew Benevolent Burial Association, four years later, and the Knoxville Hebrew Benevolent Association, whose creation was prompted by a grieving father during the Civil War. Abraham Schwab had a son who died in March of 1862. Joseph Schwab enlisted in August 15, 1862. And it was in, he was a private in the C Company of the Rock City Guards, the Army of the Confederacy. He was in Virginia. They'd marched with Stonewall Jackson, and then he caught typhoid and died. So his body was brought back to Knoxville. The Knoxville Hebrew Benevolent Association had three main purposes spelled out in the charter to provide religious services in the Ashkenazi form, because that was German, and they were mostly German Jews, to provide a Jewish cemetery for members and non-members, and to collect funds for indigent and distressed Jews. We had Jews that fought in both sides of the war in Tennessee. Certainly one of the most important mitzvot or commandments that we have as Jews is to bury our dead with as much dignity as we possibly can. It's very important to recognize that as a community and understand that when somebody loses a loved one, they need support from their community. Community support for the care and remembrance of Confederate veterans was the driving force behind a women's organization that traces its beginnings to Nashville. Here were women across the state who had sacrificed throughout the war. Many had lost sons, husbands, brothers, fathers. How do they honor their dead? Women recognize that the dead who have been killed in a battle in Tennessee are not going to be buried in a national cemetery and they decide that one of the important things that needs to happen is some creation of respectful burial sites for former Confederate soldiers. 
So across the South, and especially in Tennessee, one of the very first things the women began to do was to, to raise funds, to buy properties, to create an appropriate burial site for the Confederate dead. In Nashville, they bought a hilltop in a cemetery that had been established right before the war, Mount Olivet, and they were, were quite active in getting Confederate bodies moved from where they had died on the battlefield and been buried in very shallow trenches to these burial sites. The women also decide to provide assistance for Confederate wounded who have come back from the war but are unable to work. The state legislature, largely led by an initiative by the women of the state, implements a Confederate pension plan, but the women go a step further trying to provide what you and I would call a nursing home for Confederate wounded who were unable to live independently. And the state granted them a portion of the Hermitage property where they ran a Confederate veterans home for many years. As the years go by, the women began to think about what their grandchildren and their descendants are going to be taught and what they're going to learn about the Civil War. They were very concerned that their husbands, their fathers were going to be looked upon as traitors. So as a result of this, women in all of the 11 states of the Confederacy began organizations to honor the memory of the Confederate dead. And this is the point at which this myth of the lost cause was created. The United Daughters of the Confederacy was founded in Nashville, Tennessee by women from across the Confederacy. These women did so much work in the field of education that one of their members actually wrote a history textbook about the Civil War that they distributed widely across the South. They wanted the story told in such a way that there was honor for what these men had fought for. The UDC quickly became the most powerful women's club in the South, going on to fund the creation of hundreds of Confederate monuments during the Jim Crow era. Mutual aid societies are not the only societies that are emerging. There are these militia organizations, which, you know, sounded a little unusual if you if you think about it, but here were groups of African Americans and groups of white Memphians who were organized into militia groups. The Independent Order of Pole Bearers in Shelby County started out as a militia type organization. Many of them were former Union soldiers. They drilled and marched in parades. The Memphis riot took place in 1866, so these men banded together to say, we need to protect our community and our families. Eventually, they will be disbanded. And in Memphis, you start to see this happening during the Reconstruction period, because the city government, acting on maybe Jim Crow segregation and other fears, have become a little less willing to allow parading and operation of, of black militia units. Intolerance of African Americans exercising their newfound rights as citizens would give rise to an infamous fraternal organization whose purpose had little to do with benevolence. Formed in Pulaski, Tennessee by ex-Confederate soldiers, the hooded members of the Ku Klux Klan originally set about to frighten freedmen into believing that they were ghosts of Confederate soldiers. The pranks quickly turned violent, and in 1867, when Tennessee gave black men the right to vote, the Klan increased in brutality and number, spreading throughout the South. Once former Confederates returned to power in Tennessee in 1870, Klan activity subsided until its rebirth decades later. Rich men insure in the big companies to create an estate. Poor men insure in the fraternal orders to create bread and meat. It is an insurance against want, the poorhouse, charity, and degradation.
Everybody's Magazine, 1910. At the turn of the 20th century, mutual aid societies were more popular than ever, partially due to the fact that the aid given wasn't viewed as charity, but as repayment, enriching the giver without humiliating the receiver. There was a stigma that was pretty universal against charity being on the town, and people would avoid it. And, and the evidence for that is just overwhelming. If you had a measure of the poverty line at the time, you're talking about 40% of the population. Yet, the numbers of people getting government aid from almshouses, relief, and private charity, you're talking in the 1% range. So that's a stigma. I would use the term reciprocal to describe fraternal benefits, where you might be getting the benefit one day and you might be the giver another day. They would generally say, no, we don't think this is charity. This is our right. As the Roaring Twenties drew to a close, fraternal organizations would be tested like never before as financial disaster struck in October of 1929. The Depression is pretty significant because what happens is these groups often have a policy of carrying people on the rolls, keeping them on the rolls. You'd be behind. It'd be unlike a regular insurance company where they'd say, all right, you know, let's take up a collection, we'll, we'll carry you. It's harder to do that once you go for two, three, four, five years, because the Great Depression. So these groups do come through the Depression. I've seen historians claim that they collapse. I don't see that. I, I think they financially they come through. But what happens is a lot of people get in arrears, and eventually they drop out because they just can't pay the dues anymore, and the lodge can't keep carrying them anymore at a certain point. While many fraternal societies did manage to weather the Depression, they would come to play more of a social rather than financial role in the lives of their members. The implementation of the Social Security Act in 1935, among other changes, would diminish the need for mutual aid insurance. Another thing that comes about is the rise of third-party payment systems. Americans are increasingly tied to their jobs and to the government. So you get insurance through your job. That trend really gets rolling by the 1930s. You can see almost a straight line from the organization of the mutual aid societies to the growth and development of black business. Insurance companies were some of the earliest African-American businesses to develop. And from insurance, we find banking. Down in Memphis, Dr. J.E. Walker and A.W. Willis will form Universal Life Insurance Company. When many banks failed during the Great Depression, Universal maintained itself because it was deeply rooted in the community. Mutual aid societies filled a vital need as financial and social safety nets for millions of Americans. Their benevolent services were rendered with a degree of selflessness and a camaraderie not often found in private institutions. I think that they definitely had advantages. Now, would these groups have a place today? I think they would, but perhaps not in the same form, and I'm not a prophet, but I think that there are definitely things they had to offer that you, you do not sometimes see in neighborhoods that need this kind of thing, because it's a protection against crime, it's a way to kind of uplift the neighborhood, because people come in contact with each other. We lost a lot of the social infrastructure. The best social welfare program of all is who you know. If you lose that, then people are very much isolated. Another tradition of voluntary association that exists in the United States would be human rights organizing. And so, for example, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and some of the great social movements have always existed in the United States. The tradition of human rights is always there. Uh, waiting to be resurrected by 
activists who are engaged in voluntary association. The fraternal movement among any repressed people is the original self-help. I will help myself. I will bond with like people. I think within American history and within present America, there's room for that if we see it inclusively, not exclusively, not as something to justify violence or hatred, but something that simply represents the human spirit. A lot of historians and sociologists are really beginning to think that we've barely scratched the surface of just how many groups were out there and how widespread the membership was. These groups served a variety of purposes, and I do think at times we feel adrift, that we're still looking for community. I do think they give us something to strive for, these ideals of building better communities and building better people. It's a really fascinating part of our history that we kind of overlook in a lot of ways. We no longer join clubs to this extent, so it's hard for us to fathom why they're so important. I think, too, it's an answer for community. That deep human need to gather with others who feel the same way as you and create a community for each other. Joining these societies was not just a working class phenomenon. You see everything from physicians to factory workers to maids and laundresses all together in the same organization. If that's not a great example of American democracy, I'm not sure what is. The Citizenship Project is brought to you in part by a grant from the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area and the First Tennessee Foundation.